Chapter 21 of Tarzan and the Ant-Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Rees, Cordova, Illinois. Tarzan and the Ant-Men by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 21. For three days the six traveled toward the east, and then, upon the fourth, they turned south. A great forest loomed upon the distant southern horizon, sweeping also wide upon the east. To the southwest lay Trohanna Delmachus, a good two days' journey for their tired diadets. Tarzan often wondered what rest the little creatures obtained. At night they were turned loose to graze, but his knowledge of the habits of the carnivora assured him that the tiny antelope must spend the greater part of each night in terrified watching or in flight. Yet every morning they were back at the camp awaiting the pleasure of their masters. That they did not escape, never to return, is doubtless due to two facts. One is that they have been for ages bred in the domes of the Menunians. They know no other life than with their masters, to whom they look for food and care. And the other is the extreme kindness and affection which the Menunians accord their beautiful beasts of burden, and which have won the love and confidence of the little animals to such an extent that the diadet is most contented when in the company of man. It was during the afternoon of the fourth day of their flight that Talaskar suddenly called their attention to a small cloud of dust far to their rear. For a long time all six watched it intently as it increased in size and drew nearer. "'It may be the long-awaited pursuit,' said Zoanthrohago. "'Or some of my own people from Trohanadalmachus,' suggested Komodo Florensal. "'Whoever they are, they greatly outnumber us,' said Genzara, "'and I think we should find shelter until we know their identity.' "'We can reach the forest before they overtake us,' said Orothark, "'and in the forest we may elude them if it is necessary.' "'I fear the forest,' said Genzara. "'We have no alternative,' said Zoanthrohago, "'but even now I doubt that we can reach it ahead of them. "'Come, we must be quick.' Never before had Tarzan of the Apes covered ground so rapidly upon the back of an animal. The diadets flew through the air in great bounds. Behind them the nucleus of the dust cloud had resolved itself into a dozen mounted warriors, against whom their four blades would be helpless. Their one hope, therefore, lay in reaching the forest ahead of their pursuers. And now it seemed that they would be successful, and now it seemed that they would not. The recently distant wood seemed rushing toward them as Tarzan watched ahead between the tiny horns of his graceful mount, and, behind, the enemy was gaining. They were Veltopismacusian. They were close enough now for the devices upon their helmets to be seen. And they had recognized their quarry, for they cried aloud upon them to stop, calling several of them by name. One of the pursuers forged farther ahead than the others. He came now close behind Zoanthrohago who rode neck and neck with Tarzan, in the rear of their party. A half-length ahead of Zoanthrohago was Genzara. The fellow called aloud to her. "'Princess,' he cried, "'the king's pardon for you all, if you return the slaves to us. Surrender, and all will be forgiven.' Tarzan of the Apes heard, and he wondered what the Veltopismacusians would do. It must have been a great temptation, and he knew it. Had it not been for Talaskar, he would have advised them to fall back among their friends, but he would not see the slave girl sacrificed. He drew his sword then and dropped back beside Zoanthrohago, though the other never guessed his purpose. "'Surrender, and all will be forgiven!' shouted the pursuer again. "'Never!' cried Zoanthrohago. "'Never!' echoed Genzara. "'The consequences are yours!' cried the messenger, and on they rushed, pursuers and pursued, toward the dark forest, while from just within its rim savage eyes watched the mad race, and red tongues licked hungry lips in anticipation. Tarzan had been glad to hear the reply given by both Zoanthrohago and Janzara, whom he had found likable companions and good comrades. Janzara's whole attitude had changed since the very instant she had joined them in their attempted escape. No longer was she the spoiled daughter of a despot, but a woman seeking happiness through the new love that she had found, or the old love that she had but just discovered, for she often told Zoanthrohago that she knew now that she always had loved him. 
and this new thing in her life made her more considerate and loving of others. She seemed now to be trying to make up to Talaskar for the cruelty of her attack upon her when she had first seen her. Her mad infatuation for Tarzan she now knew in its true light. Because she had been refused him, she wanted him, and she would have taken him as her prince to spite her father, whom she hated. Komodo Florensal and Talaskar always rode together, but no words of love did the Trohana Damakusian speak in the ear of the little slave girl. A great resolve was crystallizing in his mind, but it had as yet taken on no definite form. And Talaskar, seemingly happy just to be near him, rode blissfully through the first days of the only freedom she had ever known. But now all was forgotten except the instant danger of capture and its alternative concomitants, death and slavery. The six urged their straining mounts ahead. The forest was so near now. Ah, if they could but reach it! There one warrior might be as good as three, and the odds against them would be reduced, for in the forest the whole twelve could not engage them at once, and by careful maneuvering they doubtless could separate them. They were going to succeed. A great shout rose to the lips of Orothark as his diadet leaped into the shadows of the first trees, and the others took it up for a brief instant, and then it died upon their lips as they saw a giant hand reach down and snatch Orothark from his saddle. They tried to stop and wheel their mounts, but it was too late. Already they were in the forest, and all about them was a horde of the hideous Zertalakolos. One by one they were snatched from their diadets, while their pursuers, who must have seen what was taking place just inside the forest, wheeled and galloped away. Talaskar, writhing in the grip of a she alali turned toward Komodo Florensal. "'Good-bye,' she cried. "'This at last is the end. But I can die near you, and so I am happier dying than I have been living until you came to Veltopismacus. "'Good-bye, Talaskar,' he replied. "'Living I dared not tell you, but dying I can proclaim my love. Tell me that you loved me.' "'With all my heart, Komodo Florensal. They seemed to have forgotten that another existed but themselves.' In death they were alone with their love. Tarzan found himself in the hand of a male, and he also found himself wondering, even as he faced certain death, how it occurred that this great band of male and female Alali should be hunting together. And then he noticed the weapons of the males. They were not the crude bludgeon and the slinging stones that they had formerly carried, but long, trim spears and bows and arrows. And now the creature that held him had lifted him even with his face and was scrutinizing him, and Tarzan saw a look of recognition and amazement cross the bestial features, and he, in turn, recognized his captor. It was the son of the first woman. Tarzan did not wait to learn the temper of his old acquaintance. Possibly their relations were altered now. Possibly they were not. He recalled the dog-like devotion of the creature when last he had seen him, and he put him to the test at once. Put me down, he signed, peremptorily, and tell your people to put down all of my people. Harm them not. Instantly the great creature set Tarzan gently upon the ground, and immediately signaled his fellows to do the same with their captives. The men did immediately as they were bid, and all of the women but one. She hesitated. The son of the first woman leaped toward her, his spear raised like a whip, and the female cowered and set Talaskar down upon the ground. Very proud, the son of the first woman explained to Tarzan as best he could the great change that had come upon the Alali since the ape-man had given the men weapons, and the son of the first woman had discovered what a proper use of them would mean to the males of his kind. Now each male had a woman cooking for him. At least one, and some of them, the stronger, had more than one. To entertain Tarzan and to show him what great strides civilization had taken in the land of the Zertalakolos, the son of the first woman seized a female by the hair, and, dragging her to him, struck her heavily about the head and face with his clenched fist, and the woman fell upon her knees and fondled his legs, looking wistfully into his face, her own glowing with love and admiration. That night the six slept in the open, surrounded by the great Zertalakolos, and the next day they started across the plain toward Trohanadamachus, where Tarzan had resolved to remain until he regained his normal size when he would make a determined effort to cut his way through the thorn forest to his own country. The Zertalakolos went a short distance out into the plain with them, and both men and women tried in their crude, savage way to show Tarzan their gratitude for the change that he had wrought among them, and the new happiness he had given them. 
Two days later, the six fugitives approached the domes of Trohanodomachus. They had been seen by sentries when they were still a long way off, and a body of warriors rode forth to meet them, for it is always well to learn the nature of a visitor's business in Menuni before he gets too close to your home. When the warriors discovered that Komodo Florensal and Tarzan had returned, they shouted for joy, and a number of them galloped swiftly back to the city to spread the news. The fugitives were conducted at once to the throne room of Adendrohakis, and there that great ruler took his son in his arms and wept, so great was his happiness at having him return safely to him. Nor did he forget Tarzan, though it was some time before he or the other Trohanodomachusians could accustom themselves to the fact that this man, no bigger than they, was the great giant who had dwelt among them a few moons since. Adendrohakis called Tarzan to the foot of the throne, and there, before the nobles and warriors of Trohanodomachus, he made him a zertal, or prince, and he gave him diadets and riches, and allotted him quarters fitted to his rank, begging him to stay among them always. Genzara, Zoanthrohago, and Orotharc he gave their liberty and permission to remain in Trohanodomachus, and then Komodo Florensal drew Talaskar to the foot of the throne. And now for myself I ask a boon, Adendrohakis, he said. As Zertolosto I am bound by custom to wed a prisoner princess taken from another city, but in this slave girl I have found the one I love. Let me renounce my rights to the throne and have her instead. Talaskar raised her hand as though to demur, but Komodo Florensal would not let her speak, and then Adendrohakis rose and descended the steps at the foot of which Talaskar stood, and taking her by the hand led her to a place beside the throne. You are bound by custom only, Komodo Florensal, he said, to wed a princess, but custom is not law. A Trohanodomachusian may wed whom he pleases. And even though he were bound by law, said Talaskar, to wed a princess, still might he wed me, for I am the daughter of Talaskago, king of Mandalamachus. My mother was captured by the Veltopismachusians but a few moons before my birth, which took place in the very chamber in which Komodo Florensal found me. She taught me to take my life before mating with anyone less than a prince, but I would have forgotten her teachings had Komodo Florensal been but the son of a slave. That he was the son of a king I did not dream until the night we left Veltopismachus, and I had already given him my heart long before, though he did not know it. Weeks passed, and still no change came to Tarzan of the Apes. He was happy in his life with the Minunians, but he longed for his own people and the mate who would be grieving for him and so he determined to set forth as he was, pass through the thorn forest, and make his way toward home, trusting to chance that he might escape the countless dangers that would infest his way, and perhaps come to his normal size somewhere during the long journey. His friends sought to dissuade him, but he was determined, and at last, brooking no further delay, he set out toward the southeast in the direction that he thought lay the point where he had entered the land of Menuni. A Kamak, a body consisting of one thousand mounted warriors, accompanied him to the great forest, and there, after some days' delay, the son of the first woman found him. The Menunians bid him good-bye, and as he watched them ride away upon their graceful mounts, something rose in his throat that only came upon those few occasions in his life that Tarzan of the Apes knew the meaning of homesickness. The son of the first woman and his savage band escorted Tarzan to the edge of the thorn forest. Further than that, they could not go. A moment later they saw him disappear among the thorns with a wave of farewell to them. For two days Tarzan, no larger than a Menunian, made his way through the thorn forest. He met small animals that were now large enough to be dangerous to him, but he met nothing that he could not cope with. By night he slept in the burrows of the larger burrowing animals. Birds and eggs formed his food supply. During the second night he awoke with a feeling of nausea suffusing him. A premonition of danger assailed him. It was dark as the grave in the burrow he had selected for the night. Suddenly the thought smote him that he might be about to pass through the ordeal of regaining his normal stature. To have this thing happen while he lay buried in this tiny burrow would mean death, for he would be crushed, strangled, or suffocated before he regained consciousness. Already he felt dizzy, as one might feel who was upon the verge of unconsciousness. He stumbled to his knees and clawed his way up the steep acclivity that led to the surface. Would he reach it in time? He stumbled on, and then, suddenly, a burst of fresh night air smote his nostrils. He staggered to his feet. He was out. He was free. Behind him he heard a low growl. 
Grasping his sword, he lunged forward among the thorn trees. How far he went, or in what direction, he did not know. It was still dark when he stumbled and fell unconscious to the ground. End of chapter 21. Recording by Matthew Reese, Cordova, Illinois. Chapter 22 of Tarzan and the Ant-Men. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese, Cordova, Illinois. Tarzan and the Ant-Men by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 22. A Waziri, returning from the village of Obebe the Cannibal, saw a bone lying beside the trail. This in itself was nothing remarkable. Many bones lie along savage trails in Africa. But this bone caused him to pause. It was the bone of a child. Nor was that alone enough to give pause to a warrior hastening through an unfriendly country back toward his own people. But Usula had heard strange tales in the village of Obebe the cannibal, where rumor had brought him in search of his beloved master, the big Boana. Obebe had seen nor heard nothing of Tarzan of the Apes. Not for years had he seen the giant white. He assured Usula of this fact many times, but from other members of the tribe the Waziri learned that a white man had been kept a prisoner by Obebe for a year or more, and that some time since he had escaped. At first Usula thought this white man might have been Tarzan, but when he verified the statement of the time that had elapsed since the man was captured, he knew that it could not have been his master, and so he turned back along the trail toward home. But when he saw the child's bone along the trail several days out, he recalled the story of the missing Uha, and paused just for a moment to look at the bone. And as he looked he saw something else, a small skin bag, lying among some more bones a few feet off the trail. Usula stopped and picked up the bag. He opened it and poured some of the contents into his palm. He knew what the things were, and he knew that they had belonged to his master, for Usula was a headman, who knew much about his master's affairs. These were the diamonds that had been stolen from the Big Buana many moons before by the white men who had found Opar. He would take them back to the Big Buana's lady. Three days later, as he moved silently along the trail close to the great thorn forest, he came suddenly to a halt, the hand grasping his heavy spear tensing in readiness. In a little open place he saw a man, an almost naked man, lying upon the ground. The man was alive. He saw him move. But what was he doing? Usula crept closer, making no noise. He moved around until he could observe the man from another angle, and then he saw a horrid sight. The man was white, and he lay beside the carcass of a long-dead buffalo, greedily devouring the remnants of hide that clung to the bleaching bones. The man raised his head a little, and Usula, catching a better view of his face, gave a cry of horror. Then the man looked up and grinned. It was the big Buana. Usula ran to him and raised him upon his knees, but the man only laughed and babbled like a child. At his side, caught over one of the horns of the buffalo, was the big Buana's golden locket with the great diamond set in it. Usula replaced it about the man's neck. He built a strong shelter for him nearby and hunted food, and for many days he remained until the man's strength came back. But his mind did not come back. And thus, in this condition, the faithful Usula led home his master. They found many wounds and bruises upon his body and his head, some old, some new, some trivial, some serious, and they sent to England for a great surgeon to come out to Africa and seek to mend the poor thing that once had been Tarzan of the Apes. The dogs that had once loved Lord Greystoke slunk from this brainless creature. Jad Balja, the golden lion, growled when the man was wheeled near his cage. Korak, the killer, paced the floor in dumb despair, for his mother was on her way from England, and what would be the effect upon her of this awful blow? He hesitated even to contemplate it. Thomas, the witch-doctor, had searched untiringly for Uha, his daughter, since the river-devil had stolen her from the village of Obebe the cannibal. He had made pilgrimages to other villages, some of them remote from his own country, but he had found no trace of her or her abductor. 
He was returning from another fruitless search that had extended far to the east of the village of Obebe, skirting the Great Thorn Forest a few miles north of the Ugogo. It was early morning. He had but just broken his lonely camp and set out upon the last leg of his homeward journey when his keen old eyes discovered something lying at the edge of a small open space a hundred yards to his right. He had just a glimpse of something that was not of the surrounding vegetation. He did not know what it was, but instinct bade him investigate. Moving cautiously nearer, he presently identified the thing as a human knee just showing above the low grass that covered the clearing. He crept closer, and suddenly his eyes narrowed, and his breath made a single odd little sound as it sucked rapidly between his lips in mechanical reaction to surprise. For what he saw was the body of the river devil, lying upon its back, one knee flexed, the knee that he had seen above the grasses. His spear advanced and ready, he approached until he stood above the motionless body. Was the river devil dead, or was he asleep? Placing the point of his spear against the brown breast, Kamis prodded. The devil did not awaken. He was not asleep then, nor did he appear to be dead. Kamis knelt and placed an ear above the other's heart. He was not dead. The witch doctor thought quickly. In his heart, he did not believe in river devils. Yet there was a chance that there might be such things, and perhaps this one was shamming unconsciousness, or temporarily absent from the flesh it assumed as a disguise that it might go among men without arousing suspicion. But, too, it was the abductor of his daughter. That thought filled him with rage and with courage. He must force the truth from those lips, even though the creature were a devil. He unwound a bit of fiber rope from about his waist and, turning the body over upon its back, quickly bound the wrists behind it. Then he sat down beside it to wait. It was an hour before signs of returning consciousness appeared. Then the river devil opened his eyes. "'Where is Uha, my daughter?' demanded the witch doctor. The river devil tried to free his arms, but they were too tightly bound. He made no reply to Kamis' question. It was as though he had not heard it. He ceased struggling and lay back again, resting. After a while he opened his eyes once more and lay looking at Kamis but he did not speak. "'Get up!' commanded the witch-doctor, and prodded him with a spear. The river-devil rolled over on his side, flexed his right knee, raised on one elbow, and finally got to his feet. Kamis prodded him in the direction of the trail. Toward dusk they arrived at the village of Obebe. When the warriors and the women and the children saw who it was that Kamis was bringing to the village, they became very much excited, and had it not been for the witch-doctor, of whom they were afraid, they would have knifed and stoned the prisoner to death before he was fairly inside the village gates. But Kamis did not want the river devil killed. Not yet. He wanted first to force from him the truth concerning Uha. So far he had been unable to get a word out of his prisoner. Incessant questioning, emphasized by many prods of the spear point, had elicited nothing. Kamis threw his prisoner into the same hut from which the river devil had escaped, but he bound him securely and placed two warriors on guard. He had no mind to lose him again. Obebe came to see him. He too questioned him, but the river devil only looked blankly in the face of the chief. "'I will make him speak,' said Obebe. "'After we have finished eating, we will have him out and make him speak. I know many ways.' "'You must not kill him,' said the witch-doctor. "'He knows what became of Uha, and until he tells me, no one shall kill him.' "'He will speak before he dies,' said Obebe. He is a river devil and will never die, said Kamis, reverting to the old controversy. He is Tarzan, cried Obebe, and the two were still arguing after they had passed out of hearing of the prisoner lying in the filth of the hut. After they had eaten, he saw them heating irons in a fire near the hut of the witch-doctor, who was squatting before the entrance, working rapidly with numerous charms, bits of wood wrapped in leaves, pieces of stone, some pebbles, a zebra's tail. Villagers were congregating about Kamis until presently the prisoner could no longer see him. A little later a black boy came and spoke to his guards, and he was taken out and pushed roughly toward the hut of the witch-doctor. Obebe was there, as he saw after the guards had opened a way through the throng and he stood beside the fire in the center of the circle. It was only a small fire, just enough to keep a couple of irons hot. "'Where is Uha, my daughter?' demanded Kamis. The river devil did not answer. Not once had he spoken since Kamis had captured him. "'Burn out one of his eyes,' said Obebe. "'That will make him speak.' 
Cut out his tongue, screamed a woman. Cut out his tongue. Then he cannot speak at all, you fool, cried Camus. The witch doctor arose and put the question again, but received no reply. Then he struck the river devil a heavy blow in the face. Camus had lost his temper, so that he did not fear even a river devil. You will answer me now, he screamed, and stooping he seized a red-hot iron. The right eye first, shrilled Obebe. The doctor came to the bungalow of the ape-man. Lady Greystoke brought him with her. They were three tired and dusty travelers as they dismounted at last before the rose-embowered entrance. The famous London surgeon, Lady Greystoke, and Flora Hawkes, her maid. The surgeon and Lady Greystoke went immediately to the room where Tarzan sat in an improvised wheelchair. He looked up at them blankly as they entered. "'Don't you know me, John?' asked the woman. Her son took her by the shoulders and led her away, weeping. "'He does not know any of us,' he said. "'Wait until after the operation, mother, before you see him again. You can do him no good, and to see him this way is too hard upon you.' The great surgeon made his examination. There was a pressure on the brain from a recent fracture of the skull. An operation would relieve the pressure and might restore the patient's mind and memory. It was worth attempting. Nurses and two doctors from Nairobi, engaged the day they arrived there, followed Lady Greystoke and the London surgeon, reaching the bungalow the day after their arrival. The operation took place the following morning. Lady Greystoke, Korak, and Miriam were awaiting in an adjoining room, the verdict of the surgeon. Was the operation a failure or a success? They sat mutely, staring at the door leading into the improvised operating room. At last it opened, after what seemed ages, but was only perhaps an hour. The surgeon entered the room where they sat. Their eyes, dumbly pleading, asked him the question that their lips dared not voice. "'I cannot tell you anything as yet,' he said, "'other than that the operation, as an operation, was successful.' What the result of it will be, only time will tell. I have given orders that no one is to enter his room other than the nurses for ten days. They are instructed not to speak to him, or allow him to speak, for the same length of time. But he will not wish to speak, for I shall keep him in a semi-conscious condition, by means of drugs, until the ten days have elapsed. Until then, Lady Greystoke, we may only hope for the best. But I can assure you that your husband has every chance for complete recovery." I think you may safely hope for the best. The witch doctor laid his left hand upon the shoulder of the river devil. In his right hand was clutched a red hot iron. The right eye first, shrilled Obebe. Suddenly the muscles upon the back and shoulders of the prisoner leaped into action, rolling beneath his brown hide. For just an instant he appeared to exert terrific physical force. There was a snapping sound at his back as the strands about his wrists parted and an instant later steel-thewed fingers fell upon the right wrist of the witch-doctor. Blazing eyes burned into his. He dropped the red-hot rod, his fingers paralyzed by the pressure upon his wrist, and he screamed, for he saw death in the angry face of the god. Obebe leaped to his feet. Warriors pressed forward, but not near enough to be within reach of the river-devil. They had never been certain of the safety of tempting Providence in any such manner as Kamas and Obebe had been about to do. Now here was the result. The wrath of the river devil would fall upon them all. They fell back, some of them, and that was a cue for others to fall back. In the minds of all was the same thought. If I have no hand in this, the river devil will not be angry with me. Then they turned and fled to their huts, stumbling over their women and their children who were trying to outdistance their lords and masters. Obebe turned now to flee also, and the river devil picked Kamis up and held him in two hands high above his head and ran after Obebe the chief. The latter dodged into his own hut. He had scarce reached the center of it when there came a terrific crash upon the light-thatched roof, which gave way beneath a heavy weight. A body descending upon the chief filled him with terror. The river devil had leaped in through the roof of his hut to destroy him. The instinct of self-preservation rose momentarily above his fear of the supernatural, for now he was convinced that Camus had been right, and the creature they had so long held prisoner was indeed the river devil. And Obebe drew the knife at his side, and lunged it again and again into the body of the creature that had leaped upon him, and when he knew that life was extinct, he rose, and dragging the body after him, stepped out of his hut into the light of the moon and the fires. "'Come, my people,' he cried, "'you have nothing to fear, for I, Obebe, your chief, have slain the river devil with my own hands.' 
and then he looked down at the thing trailing behind him, and gave a gasp, and sat down suddenly in the dirt of the village street, for the body at his heels was that of Kamis, the witch-doctor. His people came, and when they saw what had happened they said nothing but looked terrified. Obebe examined his hut and the ground around it. He took several warriors and searched the village. The stranger had departed. He went to the gates. They were closed, but in the dust before them was the imprint of naked feet, the naked feet of a white man. Then he came back to his hut, where his frightened people stood waiting him. Obebe was right, he said. The creature was not the river devil. It was Tarzan of the apes, for only he could hurl Kamis so high above his head that he would fall through the roof of a hut, and only he could pass unaided over our gates. The tenth day had come. The great surgeon was still at the Greystoke bungalow, awaiting the outcome of the operation. The patient was slowly emerging from under the influence of the last dose of drugs that had been given him during the preceding night. But he was regaining his consciousness more slowly than the surgeon had hoped. The long hours dragged by. Morning ran into afternoon, and evening came, and still there was no word from the sick room. It was dark. The lamps were lighted. The family were congregated in the big living room. Suddenly the door opened and a nurse appeared. Behind her was the patient. There was a puzzled look upon his face, but the face of the nurse was wreathed in smiles. The surgeon came behind, assisting the man, who was weak from long inactivity. "'I think Lord Greystoke will recover rapidly now,' he said. "'There are many things that you may have to tell him. He did not know who he was when he regained consciousness, but that is not unusual in such cases. The patient took a few steps into the room, looking wonderingly about. "'There is your wife, Greystoke,' said the surgeon kindly. Lady Greystoke rose and crossed the room toward her husband, her arms outstretched. A smile crossed the face of the invalid, as he stepped forward to meet her and take her in his arms, but suddenly someone was between them, holding them apart. It was Flora Hawks. "'My God, Lady Greystoke,' she cried. He ain't your husband. It's Miranda, Esteban Miranda. Don't you suppose I'd know him in a million? I ain't seen him since we came back, never having been in the sick chamber. But I suspicioned something the minute he stepped into this room, and when he smiled, I knew. Flora, cried the distracted wife, are you sure? No, no, you must be wrong. God has not given me back my husband only to steal him away again. John, tell me, is it you? You would not lie to me. For a moment the man before them was silent. He swayed to and fro, as in weakness. The surgeon stepped forward and supported him. I have been very sick, he said. Possibly I have changed, but I am Lord Greystoke. I do not remember this woman, and he indicated Flora Hawks. He lies, cried the girl. Yes, he lies, said a quiet voice behind them and they all turned to see the figure of a giant white standing in the open French windows leading to the veranda. "'John!' cried Lady Greystoke, running toward him. "'How could I have been mistaken? I—' But the rest of the sentence was lost, as Tarzan of the Apes sprang into the room, and taking his mate in his arms, covered her lips with kisses. End of chapter 22 Recording by Matthew Rees, Cordova, Illinois End of Tarzan and the Ant-Men by Edgar Rice Burroughs